Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. And today we are once again doing a female first, which means we are once again thrilled to be joined by the lovely, the delightful, the talented Eves. Welcome, (laughs) Eves. Hello. Hi. Once again, (laughs) happy to be here. (laughs) Yes, we're so happy to have you. Uh, We just had a... We always have these conversations before, and I'm like, why aren't we... We need to talk about this on a show, (laughs) but about celebrity culture and ownership around that and people who... Write in and complain about very specific <laughs> things and why that might be. <laughs> yeah. And if you're that kind of person, don't do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you can do whatever you want to. If it's the calling in versus just complaining, please don't complain. We have enough complaints <laughs> in our lives that we don't need. Is this some kind of intervention? <laughs> or, or maybe it might be because honestly, Annie, I think it's needed. <laughs> If you're thinking about doing something, waking up in the morning, logging onto your computer or opening your phone email app that you use and typing a rude email (laughs) to somebody, maybe just take a moment to breathe (laughs) and then like consider whether this needs to be said at all or maybe said in the way that you're considering saying it and then continue. So that might still end in you sending the email, but like... Mm -hmm. I think the least that can be done is just taking a, a pause for consideration. Right. And this is, is it constructive? Is it con- great question, Samantha? <laughs> we all need to ask ourselves. <laughs> yes. Compliments, welcome. Encouragements are always welcomed. We get a lot of those. We don't talk enough about that, but we get a lot of those. But the the ones that are the things that are out of our control, I think we had a, a like it's a constant trying to explain like ads. That's one of yeah. the number one things is be like, if we're not actually voicing these ads, the likelihood of us knowing what's happening and the, us approving it is probably didn't happen. Like, it's very rare. Yeah. So let us know without being mad at us. <laughs> yeah, do let us know because sometimes some, some of those are real bad. We agree bad. with you. We yeah. agree with you. We just didn't know it was happening. So don't be mad at us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another thing because we were talking about this, um, Samantha and I, we just did an episode on like embarrassment, and one and one of the things I I don't like is I, as I was saying celebrity culture, but it kind of freaks me out. This like when I see people like do person on the street interviews, and they're they'll just they're so eager for their like fifteen minutes that they'll just say anything, they'll do anything, and it, it that kind of freaks me out that mentality. And then something you were talking about, Eves, with you know who's going to see this thing, this angry message or whatever. Something else that I I ponder about sometimes is when people are pre-mad. So it's Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) I've seen some businesses that have signs that are like, if you don't believe in God, you ain't welcome. I go, all right, well, I'll turn around. <laughs> <laughs> and like, maybe I did, maybe I did it. But now I'm like, you're pre-angry and I don't want to deal yeah. with you. And I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. yeah. And if you walked into that store, it's like, you probably are not going to have a conversation about God anyway. So <laughs> right. you wouldn't even really know. Right. right. It's exclusionary in a totally unnecessary way. Right. Because I totally, I'm all for like, you know, put up your pride bags, you know, all that kind of stuff. But for yeah. you to be like, <laughs> immediately tell someone that you're not welcome. Don't, don't come in if not, you're straight. Right, like it may not be at, at aimed at that. Like let's say it is something about like anti-masking. If you mm-hmm. wear a mask, don't come in here. I've automatically assumed, oh, I'm also Asian, so I definitely can't come in here either. So I'll go ahead and right. move on. Even if I'm not wearing a mask, mm-hmm. you know, I'm like mm-hmm. that's an automatic sign. So you're not just cutting off that one group of people. You're cutting off a chunk right. of people right. at a level. Yes. Oh, and that, and that is pre-mad and I'm pre-scared, so I'm gone. <laughs> it's, yes. it's exhausting, though. Mm-hmm. It's exhausting to be mad without an impetus for being mad. Like, it's already, it takes a lot of energy already to be right. angry. Right, right. So to make ourselves angry before we need to be, <laughs> it's a waste of resources. It right. is. You're right. right. <laughs> Don't do it. Right, 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 right. This is not aimed at anybody in particular, by the way. We were just talking about this before. (laughs) I I was also, yeah, like there's some big news happening in like celebrity world. People are Mm. already getting mad. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is interesting. This is a this is a sociological like study of how people react when it comes to uh, fandoms. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which we've talked about before. Yeah. I think it's also just really easy now to assume that we have a wealth of knowledge based on a limited base of knowledge. Like we're thinking about celebrities and we're like, yeah, I saw in this article, like they started dating this person and they broke up with them because this person cheated on them. And I know all of this because I've been following two years worth of like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, 10 hours of like forums mm-hmm. I'm following or just yeah. articles I've read. Um, and so uh, I assume theories. that I have fan theories. I assume yeah. that I have like a wealth of knowledge about somebody's life when it's really just a very, very tiny modicum yeah. of information that I have. But I think it's easy to do that. You know? yeah. <laughs> You're totally yeah. this kind of person because I have this small amount of information about them when it's like, no. I don't. Right. <laughs> and the thing is, like, if you're doing this on your own amusement, it's a thing. But then when you start, like, blasting and calling people out, being angry at people, sending letters, sending hate things, you're like, that's yeah. where we're concerned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the issue. <laughs> that's the issue. So this is really a PSA. It's not a... <laughs> <laughs> it's not blame. No. This is a, a public service announcement. All right. There you go. <laughs> it's yes. going to be okay, everyone. It's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the piece. Yes. Yes. <laughs> We're going to get through this. But I am very excited to talk about uh, <laughs> who you brought today. I got to see some amazing art that I'd never seen before. And I'm sure this person faced a lot of criticism. (laughs) (laughs) Nice segue. A lot of ire, for sure. Who did you bring for us today, Eves? Today, we're talking about Aurora Rays. So her art is wonderful. I really recommend anybody who hasn't seen it, check it out. Um, I've only been to Mexico City once. and did not get the opportunity to see her art while I was there because it was a very short time. So I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to see some in person. But she created, she made the first mural that was done by a Mexican-born female artist. So she wasn't the first woman in Mexico. You know, we can get into these kinds of weird technicalities (laughs) when we're talking about female first. Mm -hmm. She wasn't the first woman in Mexico to get a mural commission that was an American woman, but she was the first Mexican-born woman to get a mural commission from the government. So she's considered Mexico's first female muralist. So a person who did a lot of work in Discovering and documenting the history and the biography of Aurora Rays was Dr. Dina Komasarenko Mirkin. So you can read some of her work. Um, a lot of the documentation about Aurora Rays is in Spanish. So if you are fluent in Spanish and you're able to read it, then um, you'll be able to enjoy a lot more of the works on Aurora Rays. But art historian and scholar Dr. Dina Komasarenko Mirkin has written works in English about her that you can read. And she talks about how female Mexican muralists have been, quote, virtually ignored. And she says that that could potentially be because people believed women didn't have the physicality to paint murals, that they didn't really have an interest in public art in the early 1900s, or that it was only men who painted murals in Mexico. So the history and the documentation of Mexican muralism does focus a lot on men. And it was a lot of men who were painting murals at the time due to a lot of the things that we talk about, who had access to do it, who was asked to do it, especially in these things like government commissions, who was highlighted by the people who were choosing to document certain things. But there were women who were involved in Mexican muralism, who also had political stances in their muralism. So They weren't quiet. They weren't reticent about things all the time, even though they weren't always focused on sociopolitical themes, but they were. And they had things to say, and they often said them through murals during this time period. So now I guess we can get into Aurora Ray's herself. She was born on September 9th, 1908 in Hidalgo de Parral in the state of Chihuahua. The Mexican Revolution started just a couple of years after she was born, and her family was involved in politics, and her grandfather was the politician in general, Bernardo Reyes, and her uncle was Alfonso Reyes, who was a writer and a scholar, and her mother was named Luisa Flores. So her family was relatively wealthy and had some notoriety, but 
They were politically persecuted. In 1913, her father, who was Leon Reyes, had to leave his hometown because of his political leanings, and the family fled to Mexico City. So her mother spent time baking bread, and Aurora helped with selling it at the market. And Aurora even said in a 1953 interview that, quote, art is the medium with the greatest potential to penetrate human emotions and therefore functions as a powerful weapon in the fight for the rights of the common man. She also said that she was interested in social issues because she suffered hunger and misery. So she was invested in because of her personal experience with dealing with challenges, economic struggle, and also social struggle. So she was invested in art being able to be a vehicle for making things happen in the social and political spheres. And she believed that it was a weapon. So her experiences with poverty helped her feel and empathize with what it was like to be in that struggle and helped lead her into the revolutionary practices and matters that she was involved in later in life. So this started pretty early. Her consciousness started developing pretty early, and she was already put in those spaces because of her family. And so she began attending the National Preparatory School, which is where she met Frida Kahlo. But she was only there for a short period of time, and she was supposedly expelled not long after enrolling for getting into some kind of conflict with another classmate. But she and Frida Kahlo ended up being lifelong friends. So you'll see her come up in her story over their entire lives. At age 13, Aurora Reyes began taking classes at the National School of Fine Arts, and she ended up graduating in 1924 at age 16. So it's necessary to form a foundation of a little bit of background of what was happening at the time since it was the Mexican Revolution There was a lot of political turbulence. And of course, Aurora Reyes herself was incorporating some of her own political ideas and the things that were happening in society at the time in her art. So there was Porfirio Diaz, who people listening have likely heard of before. He had been in power since the 1870s in Mexico. And he had opened up Mexico to foreign investment. So there was this thing happening where like the wealthy elite were benefiting, but the rural workers and the peasants were suffering under these policies. But Diaz suppressed opposition. And then people began to challenge his rule and to fight for land reform. So obviously that's a very abbreviated version of everything that was happening. It was very complex. um, And it was a lot more other policies than that that affected the people who were living in Mexico. But in 1911, Diaz resigned and he went into exile. So after much conflict and many changes in leadership, a new constitution of Mexico was approved in 1917. So that constitution called for things like land reform, the nationalization of resources and workers' rights. And it opened up the government's role in helping and providing for its citizens. But the president then, Venustiano Carranza, ignored this. And many historians say that the election of President Alvaro Obregón in 1920 was the end of the revolution, but there was still conflict that continued after that. So not all historians are completely aligned on that being the end, but we know how things like this can often be when it comes to war and revolution, that the beginning points and end points of things can be kind of fuzzy depending on what people want to consider the marker of end points. The point is that conflict continued and General Lazaro Cardenas was elected president in 1934. He implemented a lot of changes and he pressed for more on those revolutionary goals than people who were previously in power did. He did things like nationalize railways and the oil industry and he redistributed land and he was involved in other social and economic reforms that happened in the country. And one of those things was after 1920, public art became a more important means of educating Mexican people, many of whom were poor and who couldn't read. And murals in particular were a medium to do so. So if you're familiar with the history of art or even the way art operates in many of our cities today and how public art is very accessible to people is something that 
people in different neighborhoods of different class levels and economic situations can access. So being able to use that as a vehicle for education is something that means that it can reach more people and may even be more interesting to people. So a movement began where the government commissioned mostly male artists to paint these murals to teach folks about their history and were future facing as well. So helping them think about the history, but also in what ways they would move forward and the things that could be done, the things that should be considered to create this kind of social progress. So three names that are highly associated with this Mexican muralism movement, they were considered the three greats, were Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and Jose Clemente Orozco. They were considered the three greats, and of course, they're all men. But they were influential in that movement. Um, Aurora Ray's work focused on topics that she and many other activists, artists, like she was, were concerned with in this revolutionary era, like education, workers' rights, and gender. So Kamasarenko Mirkin, the scholar who I was referring to earlier, she talks about how women artists at that time shared common themes in their work, like the challenges of motherhood, gender violence, and infant death. And you'll see that in some of her art as well if you go and take a look at it, but it'll come up later in her story. So this is where Aurora Ray's career in art really picks up. In 1925, she had her first solo exhibition of drawings. And that same year, she married journalist and writer Jorge Godoy. She had had one child with a previous partner, and then she had one child with Jorge Godoy. She and Godoy did end up divorcing, though, and they ended contact with each other, and she raised her children. She wrote a letter to one of her children while she was pregnant at one point, and there is a quote from this letter in an essay by Dina Komasarenko Mirkin that's called Frida Kahlo and Aurora Reyes, Painting to the Voice of Concha Michel. So here's the quote. I call you my daughter because I want you to know that all women have dreamt of dignifying life. Right now, we must conquer a place of justice and respect in the face of the future so that there will be balance and fraternity among our children so that no wars arise out of clumsy ambitions and we must destroy once and for all the chains of slavery formed by ignorance, hatred, and poverty. And that's the end of the quote. So not to confuse people, she did not have a daughter. Both of her children were sons, but she still wrote this letter when she was pregnant. So clearly we see her values through this quote. We see what she cared about. We see that she cared about creating a future that was good to everybody in society. She cared about gender. She cared about no war happening. She cared about poverty. She cared about people's education levels and not just in a way that was that was emotional intelligence and also other kinds of intelligence. So in 1927, Reyes taught art in public schools and she ended up doing this for a little bit under 40 years. So a long time. She also joined that year the Mexican Communist Party, and she stayed in that party for the next 13 years. She was one of several people who later left the Communist Party and was removed from the party for having, quote, links with Trotskyist groups, always working without connection with the party's higher organizations and base, and receiving influences from people foreign to the political line of the PCM. In 1930, she was also part of the first group show of posters and photo montages in Mexico City. And she was connected with many, many artists and activists. So we've already brought up Frida Kahlo. She was also connected to Diego Rivera, Maria Izquierdo, and other people. And we also, I also earlier brought up Concha Michel. She was close to her. Concha Michel was a singer and an activist. And Aurora Reyes included a portrait of Michelle in a mural that she painted. And she painted a portrait of Michelle, Frida Kahlo, and herself that she called Concha Aurora y Frida. So she was part of her life as well. In terms of other organizations that Aurora Reyes was in, she was also part of the Mexican Republic Teachers Union and the National Peasants Confederation. 
In the teachers union, she was secretary of women's action. And through that work, she advocated for women's suffrage, things like more maternity leave and women's right to be in positions of political power, like higher government position and other rights for women. So that was a big thing that she advocated for. A lot of the work that she did was influenced by Lear or the League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists. Lear operated from 1934 to 1937, which was a short time, but it was all about art and about social responsibility. And it was ideologically aligned with leftist politics. It organized lectures and other kinds of activities. And it was really centered around the power of art, kind of going back to that quote that I brought up that Aurora Ray said earlier about believing in the power of art to create social change. So the people she was around in that organization, the ideology that it focused on and the activities that it organized were in alignment with the things that Aurora Ray has cared about. So that, in this point, we come to uh, the mural that is often talked about and associated with Aurora Reyes, which is called Ataque a la Maestra Rural, which means attack on the rural teacher. So that was created for an elementary school called Centro Escolar Revolución, which was in a neighborhood in Mexico City. So this school, according to Kamasarenko Mirkin, was a, quote, experimental model school for testing socialist education and the essential instrument for building the broad popular support needed for social reform, end quote. The school was located on the site where there used to be a prison. So that site was transformed and it became the educational institution that was the school. And that school had also had a, a gym and a track and pool and libraries. And the government commissioned the League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists to create murals for that school between the years of 1934 and 1936. So the artists commissioned to do the works in that school were Raul Aguiano, Everardo Ramirez, Gonzalo de la Paz Perez, Antonio Gutierrez, Ignacio Gomez Jaramillo, and Aurora Reyes. So there were many murals in the school and her mural was Attack on the Rural Teacher. So you can also see images of this mural online and you'll see in it that it depicts two men who are attacking a female teacher. One man is hitting the teacher in the image with the rifle, and the other one is pulling her by her hair. So the man who is dragging her by her hair is also holding money and kind of destroying a book. And the other man is wearing this thing called a scapular, which is an object that Roman Catholics wore to show their devotion to a saint, often to the Virgin Mary. So in the background of the painting, you'll see three children who are kind of peeking out from behind a column and they're hiding their faces as they look at this violent scene. There is also symbolism that identifies a man who is dragging her by her hair as a member of a Mexican Nazi group. He has on this gold shirt and his arms and legs, if you look at the shape of how they're set up in the image, are positioned in the shape of a swastika. And the money that he's holding symbolizes how his violent actions are tied to capitalism and greed. And with Aurora Reyes and her political leanings and involvement with the Mexican um, Communist Party, a lot of her ideology and the work that she did um, was indicative of her anti-capitalism stances. So the mural was a response to a massacre that happened at the time um, where at least 16 teachers were killed in a village in the state of Guanajuato. And at the time, people who supported Catholic-controlled education in Mexico often attacked rural teachers. So it wasn't something that was rare. It was a response to something that was happening semi-frequently. There was an amount of violence in that way at the time. And yeah, this work was in the school, as is put in the Power and Politics of Art in Post-Revolutionary Mexico by Stephanie J. Smith, quote, the work must have acted as a warning to protect public education for those who served on the front lines of the educational battles. So Aurora Ray is being a teacher herself, 
being concerned with education and knowing that it would be part of the way forward for women and the power that they would be able to express in the coming years was focused on education. So it made sense that she would be one of the people to create a mural for this school. Her other murals are in an auditorium in a complex that includes the National Teachers Union headquarters. These murals were originally completed between 1959 and 1961. So and she remained involved in organizations throughout her life. In 1938, she went to the National Women's Congress in Havana and Cuba as a delegate from the Teachers Union. And she also continued her art in different ways. Um, in the 1940s, many of her poems were published and she took part in solo and group shows in Mexico and around the world. And according to Kamasarenko Mirkin, she got more acclaim for her poetry than she did for her painting. In 1947, the poem Hombre de Mexico was published. And in 1953, Humanos Paisajes, her first book of poetry was published. And so she did a, a range of art for different mediums. She did lithographs for political materials. She did drawings for books and oil pieces for portrait commissions and frescoes for public work and things like that. And continued to focus on women, children, Mexican traditions, the Mexican revolution and education and those kinds of things. And she uplifted indigenous heritage and she protested authoritarian governments. So if you look at her work, you'll see that her it's colorful. The figures are often curvy, thick, like they're kind of like sensuous lines. The lines are really expressive and wavy. Um, she has a mural called El Primer Encuentro, or The First Encounter, that was done in 1978, which shows her depiction of the Spanish colonizers arriving in Tenochtitlan. And there's also Woman of War, which shows a woman that's holding a child who has passed away, and the woman is like appearing to be ready to fight. So there are a range of different um, styles kind of in her work. Like some you'll see have are a little bit more wavy. Some are a little bit more surrealistic in the style. Um, some are portraits of specific people. And of course, these murals are larger works that include a lot of people. But they're very expressive and clearly show her values and the things that she cared about at the time. She died in April of 1985 in Mexico City. And she was known during her time and was recognized during her time and the fact that she was publicly commissioned to do these murals. But um, her legacy does live on and her work still exists. And yeah, I am really uh, glad to be able to continue to uplift her legacy and the things that she did for Mexican muralism. I mean, again, I'm so glad. I'm always so happy when you bring in people I haven't heard of. And this art, her style is like right up my alley. And yeah. also, mm -hmm. I could listen to you have a podcast just like walking me through the symbolism of art. That yeah. was amazing. I, <laughs> yeah. When you, when you were doing it, I felt like I was A, back in A art history class, which I loved. <laughs> Studying was hard, but loved hearing the explanations. Uh, because you were talking about the rural teachers one, and I have it pulled up right now. You did such a great job. I was like, oh, I didn't notice that. But yeah, oh, that part too. But I do have a question. I don't know if you know much about it. Because this is a fairly violent piece of art. Uh, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. The colors are amazing. The way that it, it flows. Like you can go from the left to right in the art. Mm -hmm. But how was it received in a public space like a school? Because I can't imagine everybody loved it. That's a good question. I know in general that there were people who were against this kind of education at the time. And that's the reason that some of these attacks were happening. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly how it was like on site received by the people <laughs> who were there, because that is one of the things that is interesting to me as well. Like, of course, there was a lot of change happening at the time in terms right. of like this school being built and the kind of education that they were giving children. And it wasn't necessarily status quo. It was something that was right. just developing. So I'm really not sure. Like that's 
huh. a question that I would love to know the answer to as well. Right. Yeah, I, I would just love to see the reaction, especially because it is so controversial. Like today, seeing a piece like this, I don't think would pass. Um, there's so much that we know. Of course, we're in a different time and everything's the worst. But uh, this type of art, as much symbolism and amazing uh, history there is behind it and the story that it tells. And even though you have to take a closer look like at the the true violence of it, it's it's quite shocking that it, it has survived. Yeah. So I also, I'm glad that you brought that up, Samantha, because I'm also thinking about the fact that, yes, it's showing the things that are happening that this is the reason that education is so important, but it is physically violent. But also in this mural, she's showing children who are looking at it, which I think becomes this kind of like meta self-referential thing where there are children who are looking at this scene of violence and then there are children in the school who are looking at these children in the mural looking at the scene of violence. But it's also like these children who are going to this school have also likely seen scenes of violence themselves or a lot of them have seen scenes of violence themselves. So it's not like something they're unfamiliar with. And it just makes me think of this American tendency and proclivity to shield children from things that we deal with in real life. Um, so yeah, like I could imagine this being something that is based on perceived or what is pretended to be mainstream morals in the United States. And my, my, ex my limited experience yeah. of like how I live my life in this country being like, do we want, I mean, just think about the book bannings in the United States and the reasons right. that books are banned, like what we want our children to have, the kind of information that we want our children to have access to is such a topic of contention based on religion and morals in the United States. And that's because it's public school, like this is still a public school we're talking about. It's like, well, I have a say in what should happen here. I'm a taxpayer and this should happen. Um, so I would, I'm too, just like you, Samantha, interested in knowing the answer to this question and fascinated by it because it didn't seem like it didn't seem like this was something, the school was still allowed to exist. Right. It didn't seem like this was something where people were showing up with tiki torches, you know, at the beginning of the school day or holding yeah. signs outside of it, protesting every day. Right. At least as far as my limited information. Um, and it was allowed to exist and still exists, you know, still does. So, yeah, I, I think, I think that... Like, I don't know, in my head, I'm like, the parents are showing up at the PTA meetings, you know, like, <laughs> being like, take this mural down. Like, I can't right. imagine something like that happening then and there. Right. But I, I can't say that I am like, I, I know. Right. Well, I'm sure because she already had a reputation um, in having political stances before she was commissioned to do these types of murals. So that they may not have expected this, but they knew it was going to be a statement. They like the people who commissioned and knew it was coming. Um, I'm sure they had an idea of like, okay, this is going to be a statement more than just a pretty piece of art. And obviously it is. And again, it's gorgeous. Like it's, I hate to call anything that depicts uh, such a sorrowful time as gorgeous. But when it comes down to what she did and what she created, it is, it is art. It is, it is an amazing depiction. And then the way she made sure the colors are the blends, the symbolism, uh, the, the commonality throughout, like it's, it's perfect in my mind and what she was trying to represent. But yeah, like in knowing again, that you're right. Like I'm, I'm pushing back what I know today to what this, when this was created and like, how, how is it still standing and that we actually have evidence that she did this and that it represented this um, in its full? Because as, as we know right now, things are going terrifyingly bad at people trying to censor so much and to erase so much that it's partially like, how do we make sure that things like this keep keep staying alive and we keep having a conversation about what she represented, what she wanted to be known, what she wanted to say through her art more so than anything else. Yeah, but I think it's cool that you brought it up because it does like allow us to look at how different cultures at different times versus how we consider things today and consider the way we do things to be the right way to do things. So it's right. like, what can we learn from Aurora Ray's art and it being public art and what it depicted and how we think about what we expose children to today and in public education. It is. But I, seriously, listeners, go search out this art. Um, 
it's really, really fantastic. And it, it's, I, there's a lot of like commonalities, but there's also a lot of differences in them. So I love that she had that range, but also kind of a unique style that you could be like, oh, it's probably her. Um, so go check that out. Uh, and as always, Eves, thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you want to start an art podcast, we're, we're there. <laughs> we're ready. I'm down. Uh, don't Teach me all me. the things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't want to put any more work on you, but just say it. Just say it. <laughs> just, you know, if you did. <laughs> yeah, we'd be there. Um, but yes, thank you so much, Eves. Where can the good listeners find you? Thank you. Um, and the listeners can find me on Instagram at Not Apologizing on Twitter at Eve's Jeff Coat or on my website, www.evesjeffcoat.com. And you can find all of the other things from there and many other episodes of Female First here on Sminty about other people in history who did amazing things, followed the status quo in a lot of different ways and were their first in their respective fields. Yes, yes. Uh, we always... We love the series. We're so glad you come on and do it. So <laughs> if you've somehow missed that, listeners, go back and listen to those episodes and go find Eves. Um, if you would like to find us, you can. You can email us at stephaniedmomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at momstuffpodcast or on Instagram and TikTok at stuff I'm never told you. You can also find us on YouTube. And we have a book. You can pre-order it at stuffyoushouldreadbooks.com. Thanks, as always, to our super producer, Christina, our executive producer, Maya, and our contributor, Joey. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, you can check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 